writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of various things. And right now I'm working on a new project. But actually, talk, so far today I've gotten 1,500 words done. Yay. 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 We'll words. See, we will words. see where that goes. I wrote 493, which Way is... Way to go. Way more than I usually get yes. today, I'll tell you. High five across the table. I drew a picture of a dog. Yay. 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 Words. <laughs> okay. And with me today is my lovely co-host... Kathleen Kayembe, paranormal romance writer under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and person who has not yet written today, except for things related to Write Back Radio. <laughs> Still oh. words. Still Lee words. Savage, uh, paranormal erotic romance, and under the name Carrie Lee Williams, uh, children's books, and if you count a grocery list, that is the extent of my writing today. <laughs> Yay. Yay! Well, you know, if, if you were Stephen King, you could probably sell that. And you know, <laughs> there are poems made out of grocery lists that are pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator, and as said before, I was drawing today... Sometimes you got to do the bill pay job. Mm. Ain't that the truth? I thought you fell asleep. She wanted that to. was off the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thanks for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I fell asleep immediately after drawing the dog. <laughs> it was riveting, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> She's a cute dog. <laughs> I'm sure. I didn't sound sure. <laughs> I'm so sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm Brad R. Cook. I am the author of lovely steampunk novels like Iron Horseman and Iron Zulu. Uh, check them out, and a third one might be coming at the end of this year. So uh, be, I was not Yay. writing that today, but I'll be writing that tonight. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Fedora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. And coming on February 17th, that's the release date of Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Yay! Yay. Yay. And if you can't tell, while we don't take everything quite seriously, we do take our writing seriously. In case you're brand new to the show. And today we're going to talk about um, Octavia E. Butler. And her rules for writing, along with Right Pack Radio's number two rule for writing. And today we're continuing on with a series that we've been doing, just got started back in January. And that is we are honoring either the birth or the death anniversary of a famous writer. And in this case, this is the 10th anniversary, I believe, mm -hmm. of Octavia's passing. Mm-hmm. So today we're going to have a wake, but this time we don't have any mead. No, well, we're like only acting time. like we have mead right now. I <laughs> yes. was like, is this a sympathetic kind of tipsiness? <laughs> this is it's, it's All a right, guys, over. let's rock this. So All right. before we jump into Octavia Butler, let's go ahead and take care of our um, number two rule, and then let's talk about who Octavia Butler is and her rules. So what is the number two rule of Right Pack Radio? Service All right, says, I will read it. Place your audience first. The reader is the writer's partner because the story only fleshes out inside the reader's mind. Involve readers by making them work for the payoff, which comes in the ending. Of course, the payoff must be worth the reader's investment of time and energy. Give readers a satisfying read. Part two of that is writers must find ways to get readers to invest themselves, not just intellectually, but also emotionally. And lastly, use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel the time was wasted because you can't please everyone, write for your own personal ideal reader. I'm going to say there's 100% in agreement, obviously, with our own rule, but... <laughs> no bias but, there. There's no bias I disagree. there. disagree. No. But no, I was going to say that really, there's two examples I can think of. I'm not going to say one name because the author is alive. As far as I know, the other one's dead by now, but... Um, the author, we'll take care of that shortly. The, yeah, the author is if not. It will be not only the, uh, the one that's alive is very famous in her field. Yes, it's a female. That's as much as I'm going to reveal on this. But there, there was a book. Talk about 
having to have a satisfied read and not just be involved intellectually. This one book was well over a thousand pages long because it didn't. It took until page nine hundred and something for me to finally get into it, past the intellectual aspect. Mm -hmm. I kept getting promised, "Yes, do that." And also, I was told never to read the epilogue. <laughs> the epilogue took away all the satisfaction and made me almost throw the book in the trash. It would have been in the trash if I actually had owned the book. Um, Question. And made me walk made me walk away from that author for a good ten plus years. Go ahead. Was this the epilogue to Harry Potter book seven? No. <laughs> okay. It was Just actually checking. before Harry Potter. Just checking. Go on. So Harry before. Potter did not uh, trademark the unsatisfying epilogue. No. <laughs> but it did follow in a very healthy tradition. <laughs> <laughs> The other book is one I'm trying to read right now, um, and I say trying. Um, sadly, I couldn't tell you what page I'm on or number up where I'm at in the book because it's, I'm reading it online on Kindle, and all you can do is tell number size clicks. Well, that doesn't help me any. But the book actually is the idea behind the game um, Assassin's Creed. And the book is called, if I mispronounce it, excuse me, Alamut. Which is all about the assassins back under um, oh god of course there goes my there goes my thought <laughs> um, Al -Sh Al Shabab um, but anyway is written by Vladimir Bartol and so far where I'm at there has been absolutely no real conflict in this book and I keep wanting to fall asleep on it and I know I'm not that far along mm -hmm. and that's been rare for me. To run into. Go ahead. So, a uh, question about that then. Uh -huh. What would make you feel more awake as an audience? Because it sounds like this book is trying to inform, but it's forgetting the audience that it's... Yeah, what the book is in this is... The story is supposed to be about two characters. I have not... I, I have met the other character so far, but it hasn't happened yet. It's supposed to be a romance that will occur between these two characters in the middle of... Um, when this Brotherhood of Assassins existed, and the Brotherhood of Assassins literally controlled through fear and assassination, but they, they didn't do they didn't do um, blowback on it. It was always up front, like I'm going to kill you, and you, that's it. <laughs> no subterfuge at all. But just where, but where, but where I'm, say you're going to die yeah. and kill you. But where <laughs> I am, what well, I'm having a problem with the good old days. Um, the first character like is. I think she's about 11, 12 years old, basically, but she's basically been sold from one master into, into another aspect of slavery, has been brought to this palace where now she's being treated like a princess. No problem. I have no problem with it if this is how this character goes. There has been no conflict for her. The only conflict which has just now recently come up is don't ask any questions. Hmm. Don't be curious about things. Well, of course, she's young. She's going to be curious, but... Even what she's been curious about, there's been no conflict. What's the big deal about conflict for a reader? Well, for conflict for readers, what, what, is this, what is this character going through? This character feels, to me, to be very cardboard. This character feels very much, I'm along for the intellectual concept of his journey and nothing beyond that. I have no emotional attachment to her. I have no... Fear that something's going bad is going to happen to her, or something good she's going to achieve. I have nothing but. Oh, okay. So this is what this world is like. So you need more emotional investment, and yes. the book is not offering that. Exactly. And I gotta say, I commend your commitment because if it was me, my to be read pile is way too big. <laughs> I would have already thrown the book to the side, mm -hmm. given up, and started another book. Yeah, it doesn't and take a lot for me yeah, to put this down. This is why they tell you not to do that anymore. Right. And because to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But they if can't tell you what to read or what not to read, Brad. No, 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 no. I'm talking about with a modern day novel. Like right. modern day novelists are taught not to do that. Not to do with what this novelist did. And to be honest, you gotta with catch you, your reader quick. Yeah, you do. And to be Thanks honest, the if this book was not a about a certain time period, which I find of interest, especially this is a group of assassins that existed, but number two, if it had not been the um, inspiration behind that big game series, I so probably would have already talked to Play Assassin's Creed like. instead of reading this. <laughs> play, <laughs> Assassin's <laughs> Creed. play Assassin's Creed 2 instead of reading this. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and on that. Oh, so Brad mentioned the term hook. Could you explain it and why it's important? Sure. Uh, well, a hook, and I think we've dealt 
devoted episodes to hooks before. Yeah. Uh, but a hook is essentially the first bit of your novel, uh, and it is meant to, as is the word, hook the reader, pull them in, and drag them through the rest of the book. Uh, and usually, uh, the hook is going to be something that is going to kind of snatch the reader's attention right away. It could be something fun, something crazy, something action, uh, some revelation, some intrigue, something along those lines that's going to say to the reader, I can't set this book down until I know everything. I want you to think about why some stories seem to start and just talk about the weather and just talk about this and that and the other. And, of course, we know, because we have that urge, too, it's to set the scene, to tell people what's going on, where they are, and so on. But is that a good thing to do in a novel? And I've got to say, it is not. And (laughs) why is it not? Because it does not catch a person's interest. People say, when is the story going to start? Just as David did. When is the story going to start? When is something going to happen? So that is the first thing that you have to do. All this other stuff can wait and should. Um, I was going to say, I think a hook should take place within the first three chapters of the book. Preferably something in your first chapter. How yes. about the first page? It's got to be the first page, page or your yeah. agent's going to toss yeah. it yeah. And it literally has yeah. to be within the first 200 words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The hook has to be there. Uh, now, what draws your reader into chapter four, five, six, and seven? Mm-hmm. That can be there, the setup and all that. But a hook should hook from that very first line, if possible. Um, yeah, you were mentioning starting out with the weather, Fedora. Uh, I, I have to say, I was just in a uh, webinar with uh, an agent, and we were talking about. She was talking about, and we were asking questions and much stuff back, but uh, just about this. And part of it is a a movie thing. So we are so used to seeing movies, and movies love to do the cinematic zoom in. Mm -hmm. So you start with a grand view of something, and then you narrow down to your character. Uh, That that's become kind of a you know something in the mindset of a lot of people that you should do this. This is how you begin something. Well, the reality is, if you look at a lot of movies now. They don't do that. They start right there in the action the same way, just to hook you in the very same. Uh, there are, though, books that do start with the weather, but usually the setting, the weather, or something like that is going to be a character uh, in that first chapter, and that's the reason why you're starting off with it. Um, but, you you know, to be honest, I, I, I always say uh, hook them with your character. Because, yeah. you know, your main character is who the reader is going to invest the entire rest of the next several hundred pages in. And hopefully series beyond that, Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. My kind of rule of thumb is um, I generally think that people want to be, want to make friends with their book. Their book, you want to know what the book's personality is and you want to spend time with it. Uh, The way you make friends with a book is you have to give the book a character that people can identify with and people know. So my, the main character of the book that I'm reading, if I like them, or if they're interesting enough that I want to hang out with them, that person becomes my friend, and therefore his book is my friend, and I want to follow his adventure. The weather is hard to make friends with. So start the book with some, you know, a, a good how, how do you do? How you doing, book? Uh-huh. Let's be friends. <laughs> show me your character. Show me your, uh, your tone. Show me why I want to spend the next however many hours of my life hanging out with you. And we've got so many distractions in our life nowadays. I mean, think about it. We want to be engaged in a book that we've picked up and that we're going to read. We've got the news that demands attention. We've got social media that demands attention. We've got parents, family members, cats, dogs, I don't care. Mm -hmm. They demand attention. And what's Mm -hmm. going to... And if... I'm going to spend five minutes even trying to get into a book. That's going to be five minutes in which I'm, my mind's already going, so what's on CNN right now? Mm-hmm. I think a key mistake that many writers make is telling too much. Yes. It's because, well, think about this. Why do people still read books? You know, there were predictions that when... Um, Movies came along, nobody would read. And when radio came along, they wouldn't go to movies or read. And that when TV came along, 
everybody would forget the radio, forget the books, then TV, and guess what? We still have all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people prefer ones over the others, but ask yourself why that is so. What is it they prefer? Why would people rather read a book than go to a movie? What do you think? As um, There's this great picture that goes around that um, I've seen where it shows, like, the castle. And it shows, like, for the movie, it only shows this much. But, like, for a book, it shows the depth, the full depth. Because when you do a movie, you only scratch the surface. The book, you get the rest of the story. And I've seen the same meme, but with an iceberg. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Can you just tell them what you were doing with your hands? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Basically, the tip of the iceberg is what the movie or the TV show or whatever covers, and the what's depth of the water? iceberg. Right. Above water is what that is, and what's below water is the depth that a book can go into. Mm-hmm. Well, let's then go to the depth of the ocean, because that's where the reader comes in. Mm-hmm. Because in a book, you can only do so much. You can only explain so much. Because you have 80,000 words, 100,000 words, Mm -hmm. and that will give a lot, but it's certainly not going to be exhaustive. And that's what I think the readers like. They Mm -hmm. like to bring themselves to the story and visualize the characters. Yeah, they're much more interactive than they would be watching television or a movie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even more, I think, than in an electronic game. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. uh, back, back you two. Back, back. No. Really? And I had to break up my first 40 fight. 40 to 100 some odd hours in a game, though. I, I will give the game credit for that. And depending <laughs> on what kind of game it is, sometimes you're writing your own story while you're in there. There you yes. go, too. Yeah, with some games, I guess the point is you can actually spend thousands and thousands of hours in them. Yes. Rex. Uh, yeah. Shepard. So, wow. But <laughs> I, I will throw out the <laughs> that like Skyrim, where it's like plot. Why should I follow the plot? Yeah. I'm too busy making my own trail. Minecraft. Come on. Putting putting mods in to put giant Thomas the Tank Engine brand. <laughs> <on. laughs> I am restraining from a comment. Go ahead. I will say the other thing that a book does, and books, not just one book, but books in general. Uh, for all of us, we have but one life to live. However, through books, I can live thousands of lives yes. in across different thousands of worlds. Yes. Uh, in my own lives. world and across others and even some places like Westeros that I don't think I'd actually want to go to. Uh-huh. Um, you know, so there are places that books can take you that you wouldn't want to go. There are places that books can take you that you do want to go and you want to spend more and more time in, like Middle Earth. Um, so, you know, I can run around and I can have these kinds of adventures. Uh, I think that's the honest reason why I became a writer, um, was so that I could continue to have these adventures, but now craft them myself and... Mm-hmm you know, throw them out there. So speaking of crafting your own adventures and your own stories, let's go and address to the next level, which is Octavia E. Butler and her rules for writing. Before we go into those rules... How about a fun fact? How about some information about Octavia? Who is she? Amazing is who she is. She Um, is amazing. I just wikied her. She's awesome. I just wikied her. (laughs) She is. I'll even admit that. I hadn't wikied her. I only knew a little bit about her, but I just totally wikied her. She's awesome. (laughs) All right, so Octavia Butler, born June 22nd, 1947. She died February 24th of 2006, which is 10 years ago. Um, She was 58 years old, and when she died, I found out the day after going into my science fiction class at school where we had just finished her book, Dawn, Mm -hmm. which is um, the first book of a trilogy that uh, is called Lilith's Brood that actually Fedora has the book here, the omnibus edition. I was really sad because Octavia Butler meant a lot to me. It was, she was, her coming to that school was one of the reasons that I wanted to go there because I was like, if she came here, she might come again. My friends had signed copies of her books and she was friends with and kind of mentor to a writer on staff at the school. She had actually been supposed to come to the school again and come talk to our class. So I was really mad when she died. <laughs> really mad. Like, Universe. all those stories she was never going to write, and I was never going to get to meet this woman who had meant so much to me. I discovered, quote unquote, Octavia Butler when I was at a fashion show kind of thing mm. for, um, I, I think it was a, a black focused charity a charity focused on uh, african americans i don't remember what it was for and before you went into the room where the fashion show was being held there were there was a room full of booths where people were selling different things and i stopped of course at the booth full of books 
because it was the only thing interesting to me in this room full of stuff that women are supposed to like. Okay, let's be honest. So I stopped at the books, but they were all like romance, but like romance between like some fly girl whose culture I had no idea about mm -hmm. and some bad boy who I didn't care about. Um, I write gay romance. Let's just put that out there. So these books were not to my taste and I was like, ah, oh, there's nothing here for me. And the guy behind the booth looked at me and he said, what are you looking for? And I was like, well, I read sci-fi fantasy. He's like, hold on a minute. You need to read this. And he slipped me a copy of Octavia E. Butler's book called Wild Seed. And it changed my world. <laughs> <laughs> it starts off in Africa with a woman who is immortal and a shapeshifter. And the first encounter she has is with an immortal like her, but he kills people, whereas she nurtures them. And it goes from there. It's beautiful. Mm. Um, so from that book, I was hooked. I went through like a huge reading binge of as much for stuff as I could get at the library. And um, from there, an obsession was born. Octavia Butler is pretty interesting because she was the first female sci-fi fantasy writer on the scene in the 70s at a time when there was only one other black sci-fi fantasy writer. That was Samuel R. Delaney. He was a dude. So, uh, for one thing, she's a trailblazer in that way. She won a lot of awards in her time, um, her short years writing, I guess. The MacArthur Fellowship, which is nicknamed the Genius Grant. She won the Nebula Award, the Hugo Award, for a few different things. I think um, that deserves a toast somewhere. Can we yeah, toast her? Cheers. Yeah. See you, Cheers. 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 I just kind of noticed one thing. But she's multi'd, as you said, multi'd award on the Nebula, multi-award on the Hugo. She went from 1967, fifth place, at a short story contest, and the next award I don't see shows up until 85. Can you imagine what she was going through as she was writing and then be awarded 20 years later, give or take? Well, she was, if nothing, if not persistent. She has a book called Blood Child and Other Stories, and in it she has a few essays on her writing, and one of them is autobiographical. And in it she she was telling herself stories at like four and six. Her mom tricked her into reading, and it was brilliant um, the way she did it. She would read just enough so that Octavia was hooked on the story, and then she'd hand her the book and say, here, you finish it. <laughs> just <laughs> let it go that way. If I ever have a child, no, parenting rule number one. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, Octavia wanted to be a writer from pretty much 10 years old, 10 years old, or as soon as she knew that writing could be a thing you did for money. Mm -hmm. She was extremely discouraged by her, uh, her aunts, um, by her aunt and honestly, the sci-fi field where again, there were no black writers, there were no black characters. It was all, you know, white men writing these things, mm -hmm. but she still yeah. wanted to do this. Um, she... What was it? She submitted a story at 13 and wasn't published again until she was in her 20s. She attended Clarion, the uh, sci-fi fantasy writing workshop, very prestigious, and was uh, mentored by Harlan Ellison, actually. Hmm. So you may know that name. What else can I say about her before we get into her rules? She lived a very hardworking life. She was very hardworking. She worked a lot of menial labor kind of jobs and wrote, sometimes getting up at two in the morning for years and years, two in the morning, then three, then four and five, until she could make a living at her writing. And um, one of the things that Wiki says about her that I think is important to read before I let Fedora take the floor is her critical reception on Wikipedia. Most critics praise Butler on her unflinching exposition of human flaws, which she depicts with striking realism. The New York Times regarded her novels as evocative, if often troubling, explorations of far-reaching issues of race, sex, power. The magazine of fantasy and science fiction called her examination of humanity clear-headed and brutally unsentimental, and Village Voices' Dorothy Allison describes her as writing the most detailed social criticism, where the hard edge of cruelty, violence, and domination is described in stark details. Locus, a big sci-fi fantasy magazine, regarded her as one of those authors who pay serious attention to the way human beings actually work together and against each other, and she does so with extraordinary plausibility. Houston Post ranked her among the best science fiction writers, blessed with a mind capable of conceiving complicated futuristic situations and shed considerable light on our current affairs. 
that shed considerable light on our current affairs. She can write a group of people like nobody's business, like nobody I've ever seen before. The people will be brutally real. She will write our human flaws, and she will write the things that will get in our way that usually aren't allowed to get in the way of novels because it's much more difficult to write that kind of story. So if you ever want to see a good group dynamic story, read Octavia Butler. Read her. Fedora, <laughs> you were going to say something. Oh, I'm going to, yes. <laughs> what struck me, and you may uh, say something about this if, you'd, if, you, if you would care to, it seemed to me that she attempted to be very inclusive Now, I certainly admit that I haven't read this humongous trilogy called Lilith's Brood, but it seemed to me to be an argument for inclusion and understanding one another in a very uh, complicated sort of way, in a long-winded sort of way, too, rather, because the creatures that she imagined were sort of humanoid, but they had snake-like hair and no (laughs) noses or mouths and would get all sleek when they were pleased and would bristle when they weren't. So they looked most peculiar, to be sure. And yet, they had to find a way to get along with humans. And Lilith, apparently, is the Earth Mother human in the work. And I I like that a lot in terms of of, uh, mythology. In the Bible, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain slew Abel, so Abel was dead, and and Cain was kicked out. Where he went someplace else and married some woman who came upon the scene, who knows, however. Then Adam and Eve had another son, Seth. And she, too, he, too, found a wife from heaven knows where. But in Jewish philosophy, Adam already had two wives, Lilith and Naamath. And Lilith was the first wife, but she didn't work out. He didn't like her because she refused to be subservient to him. Mm And uh, I guess she didn't like the missionary position, <laughs> whatever the cause. That was yeah, a little nod to top. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> that Lilith had to go her own way. And she populated the world with demons, which I suppose is part of the entire reason as to why we have negativity in the world. Well, that's what but you get she when was the on top. <laughs> demons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that conclusion. <laughs> yeah. 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 Next <laughs> top model theme. And on this yeah. note, yeah. David Zips has looked completely. Oh, yeah. Golly. But at any rate, whether they whether the her children were demons or not, one thing is pretty clear. She was an independent woman. And that is why maybe twenty years ago a number of Women singers, rock singers especially, started the Lilith Fair because they could not get a gig uh, with two women on the same bill ever, and they wanted to do their own thing. It lasted a while, and I think has sort of proved that it's possible for women to rock out, too. Yeah, it was a great, great festival. Yeah, it didn't last long. It really should last, have lasted longer. But now we have more prominent women in rock, I think, than we once did. At any rate, Lilith's story is one of women rebelling. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is a story important on its own. And I think that that is what Olivia Butler had in mind when she wrote Lilith's Brood. Mm-hmm. The other thing I would say is that Lilith, um, in the story, uh, the main character, is kind of having to create a new race of people with these aliens. That's part of the deal that she strikes with them. They're going to change her and change the the children she has and the other survivors of Earth that they have picked up. Um, they're going to create a new race. It's kind of make, like making a deal with the devil in some ways because these aliens are great, but they have something that they want from the people too, and it's not a good thing. So... So what's one? Of, so tell me about her rules. All right. Yeah. Let's. let's Sorry, let's I, I, go I, I just. The rules. Yeah. We could talk forever about the plot of. We uh, can. The books. And I'm being mean, but I, I just looked at the timer. I'm like, yeah, we got time. It's all good. Time. So Octavia Butler wrote an essay called Furor Scribendi, um, where she has some rules for writing. Um, she says learning the rules is the easy part. Following them and turning them into regular habits is an ongoing struggle. 
So just keep in mind that these are easy to learn, but harder to put into practice. Her first one is read. Read about the art, the craft, and the business of writing. Read the kind of work you'd like to read. Read good literature and bad, fiction and fact. Read every day and learn from what you read. Let's see what else. She also suggests books on tape because they provide a painless way to ponder use of language, the sounds of words, conflict, characterization, plotting, and the multitudes of ideas you can find in history, biography, medicine, the sciences, etc. And I'm going to say something really fast. One, number one, I'm going to say, yes, I totally agree, especially with books on tape, but when was that, when was that essay written, more or less? Let me find it. The reason why I'm bringing up that question is as a huge, very much a huge piece of advice that went ignored, I think, by some, because, at least as I know growing up, books on tape was considered something you did not do unless you were not capable of reading which is complete and total BS. But go ahead, please. Oh, I do want to say that Octavia Butler had a form of dyslexia that was not recognized at the time she was growing up either. Um, so some of her teachers thought she was just, you know, slacking off, and mm -hmm. really it was she had dyslexia, but she still read a lot and read a lot of books on tape as well, or audiobooks in our time. Mm -hmm. Might have dated that a little bit, books on yeah. tape, mm -hmm. audiobooks. That's all right, but yeah, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I'm glad she did. I mean, she sounds like a fantastic writer. Yes, I've not read her. But the fact she wrote that into an essay, and I know Stephen King later has written it, written it as well, but I believe this was written before he wrote that, and I could be wrong. It was written for Writers of the Future. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard presents Writers of the Future 9. I'm pretty sure they're probably close to the 20s now. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, sure. And books on tape was something that helped me get through language as well and understanding, even though I could, even though I read, books on tape really have had and still does help with what I do. So I'm a writer. Why do I need to read anything? Question. Wait, you mean it's not going to like, I'm going to like suck the ideas out and plagiarize it comes, them crazy? It comes <laughs> out of your head like Athena, out of Zeus's head. No. Why Why bother reading in the first place? Well, writers number one, are readers. Right. Number one, how do you use language appropriately or use, usefully yeah, I think I just made up a word. Um, How do you use things usefully? No, the way I'm trying to phrase it. Effective. For, to reach your audience. If you're going to write, you have an audience. At least that's the idea. And hopefully it's not the cat you just sit and read and, <laughs> read and torture. Or find at the bottom of the bottle. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, every, every writer has a, has a style. And part of that, we got to learn how to find that style. And sometimes we imitate and sometimes we learn how other writers get there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought somebody had something. I told my mom that I read the Koran, and she said, why would you do that? I said, because I wanted to see what it said. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we read. We want to learn things. Exactly. We are infinitely curious. I think all writers are. Yes. And they bring, they bring a artist palette of how they, whoever, whatever you read, everybody has brought an artist palette as to how they write it, and that affects how we write. Butler read a lot of nonfiction, and uh -huh. I think it helped her in her science fiction writing a lot, and also in her writing about how humans interact, and for things like writing aliens or writing um, our interaction with certain diseases, which she did, um, learning a lot about these actual diseases and the way the animal kingdom worked helped her immensely in her writing. Well, I would say that you can sit in English class, and you can be taught how to construct a sentence. Uh -huh. But the reality is, is that if you really want to learn how to craft beautiful sentences, you go to people who've crafted beautiful sentences and you read their amazing work. You know, I would love to be able to write like Shakespeare. I am never going to go into a class and be taught how to write like Shakespeare. But reading and listening and reciting Shakespeare means that I too can craft to be or not to be. You know, and, and go from there. So mm -hmm. the, the, I think as writers especially, we read to kind of further our craft. Does what we read make a difference? Or can we just read anything? Like, I like reading the backs of cereal boxes. Does that cut it? Sure. Really? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, Explain. I don't know. Now you know how to use riboflavin in a word in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen a use of a sentence on the back of a cereal box. Just the name. But, no. Meat, soy, and eggs. Your question was, I'm sorry, I just got distracted by rival appointment. 
No, it doesn't matter what we what doesn't we read. Doesn't matter what we read. And I'd say yes, it does matter yes. what you read, because if you're reading crappy books, that might not be the best uh, thing for your writing. Garbage in, garbage out. Maybe, or uh, or it could teach you. As I was just about to go there, yeah. yeah, it could totally teach you how to write better. I mean, we've sat around and talked about the ways we would redo movies all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's us seeing the way they've unfolded a story, and then going, I would have done it much better. <laughs> or at least down a different road, yes. Well, as to reading cereal boxes, I'm not sure that's all bad because it suggests that we have developed a habit of reading yeah. and therefore we will read whatever com we come across. We can't do otherwise. And I think that's a good thing for writers. Uh -huh. for maybe for everybody. And you never know in what post-apocalyptic world you're going to need, you know, price conditions, stocks <laughs> and units. Well, and... Just going back in history. Just I just read a sign behind you, by the way. That's fine. <laughs> so, let's go back in history just a little bit, and then I'm going to pump, bump it up here with something, and then I'm going to turn this over back over to my co-host. Go back far enough in history, we'll say ancient Egypt and so forth. The pharaohs, kings in other lands, your royalty, and most of your people had no clue how to read and write. Who had the power? The scribes. They were the communicators. They knew how to read. They knew how to write. They actually, people have translated some of the letters back and forth and still seen the sidebars. They were more or less, if I was writing, if I was a scribe for mm -hmm. Queen Kathleen and Jennifer was a scribe for King Brad, it'd be, on, uh, you know, here's the message. Mm -hmm. And, hey, Jen, how's, how are the kids doing? And what's the latest on your house? Blah, blah, blah. And, by the way, when you read this, emphasize to King Brad the word blah when you, and so forth. <laughs> So that kind of takes back it, reading and writing. There's a certain amount of power that comes with that. Bring it forward. Modern day, I don't care who's in politics. I'm not even going to bring up politics. But when a president gives a speech, I don't listen to the speech. I want the transcript because it's when I read it, I actually see what they're saying. I like to see who's falling asleep in the background. Well, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about as far as getting the, getting the details or getting the thrust. I like when he picks up the microphone and drops it off the podium and then walks off. Mm -hmm. Because that happened. Um, something Brad said about uh, people getting paid to write terrible things and reading terrible things mm -hmm. resonated with the list of facts that I have been given by the lovely Lee. Mm -hmm. One of the things... Uh, one of the facts is Octavia Butler decided to write science fiction because she hated a movie, Devil Girl from Mars. <laughs> she was like, this is so bad. I cannot believe this is actually a movie. I could write better than this. And then she realized, I could write better than this. Anyone could write better than this. And then she realized, somebody got paid to write something this awful. I could definitely do better than this. I just had a similar experience with Killer Clowns from Outer Space. No. Oh, my goodness. Classic cult film, by the way. I highly kind of recommend it. But, yeah. Yeah. Anyone That's could write scary. better dribble than that, and I'm definitely going to try. You're on your way to winning some Nebulas and Heroes, sir. There, there you go. So All what's right. next? Uh, our second, her second rule actually relates to audience a bit. She says, take classes and go to writers' workshops. Writing is communication. You need other people to let you know whether you're communicating what you think you are and whether you're doing it in ways that are not only accessible and entertaining, but as compelling as you can make them. In other words, you need to know that you're telling a good story. And then a bit ahead of that, workshops and classes are rented readers, rented audiences for your work. Learn from the comments, questions, and suggestions of both the teacher and the class. These relative strangers are more likely to tell you the truth about your work than are your friends and family who may not want to hurt or offend you. Go ahead, Brad. I'll get I, I would actually throw out that that's a critique group uh, who's going to help you with that kind of stuff because I, I'm going to ask that if you come to a workshop, maybe you don't make it all about your work. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you ask general <laughs> questions that are going to help you out or something like that. You'll annoy uh, everyone. Exactly. If you, do. you know, because you're going to ask nah, 30 questions all about your book. No. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but it, that's exactly what a critique group or a reading group right. or a book club, if you can get your book into a book club, that is an amazing experience. Um, you know, so I, I would say aim at those kind of things. Or unless you're teaching the workshop, maybe then. Then you could That's talk good, yeah. all about your book. Well, hopefully you talk a little bit about your book if you got a workshop because you've got that collective audience. Exactly. Right. Um, hopefully you're selling a few, too. Amen. <laughs> I've always... That's not true. I've... In my, in my later life, part of my life, 
when I've actually dug into what's called quantum physics, I've always equated this to writing. Quantum physics, and the the this, this, uh, the scientist will say, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't understand quantum physics. <laughs> and I've always felt that with writing. If you if I can walk into a workshop or into a conference and say, "Ah, there's nothing here. No one is going to teach me anything. I know it all. I know absolutely nothing." This is true. I think it's important to learn when you have a captive audience, too, Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. as far as writers' workshops go, mm-hmm. um, because these are people who are also interested in writing, otherwise they wouldn't have signed up. These are people who can teach you things, whether or not it's directly applicable to what you write. They can teach you how to critique. They can teach you what to look for in your writing that maybe you didn't realize was something you should be looking for before. Yep. And they can teach you through their, ta- their comments and questions about other people's work or their own work what you should be looking for in your own. One of the most amazing experiences I've had as a writer is not my first book, but my second book. When it came out, uh, talking to people, because it's a series, it's a trilogy, talking to people who'd read the first book. um, It was an amazing experience because they knew almost more about my novel than I actually knew about my novel. (laughs) Uh, And and the ability to have that conversation and to talk about the characters and to talk about, you know, and what they loved and what... You know, kind of, they were projecting into the future as to what they might see in the second book and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was an amazing experience. Uh, and there's one, the geek side of talking about your work. And, you know, I think this happens anytime you love anything. This is why I love getting together with Star Wars fans and talking about Star Wars mm-hmm. or things mm-hmm. like that. But when you really immerse yourself in talking about the characters and the plot and the themes and what happened and the twists and all that kind of fun stuff, uh, y- you're exploring well beyond the words and that that is something that i think is just an amazing experience to do and for the author and for the writer i think it's a kind of a really amazing thing to get to kind of experience you created this and now everyone's kind of embracing it but i think beyond that just as readers uh that that similar thing you know sitting around fandom you know mm-hmm. talking about fandom it's, uh-huh. it's just kind of an amazing experience I'd like to propose a toast to Octavia Butler now. Yay. To Octavia. What's, to Octavia. The What's the toast? The toast is me. related to writing workshops. Okay. Octavia yes. Butler <laughs> has the Carl... Okay, the Carl Brandon Society has a, scholar- a scholarship in Octavia Butler's honor. It's called the Octavia E. Butler Memorial Scholarship Fund, and it allows the recipient to attend one of the Clarion writing workshops for science fiction and fantasy. Butler attended Clarion West and was the only African-American writer in her workshop, which is certainly not true anymore. So yes, another trailblazing moment for Octavia Butler. Toast. Yes. Toast. 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 Amen. Okay. Shall we go on to rule number three? Rule number three. Mm-hmm. All right. Rule number three is write. Write every day. Write whether you feel like writing or not. Choose a time of day. Perhaps you can get up an, early, an hour earlier, stay up an hour later, get up at two in the morning like Miss Butler did <laughs> every day before work. <laughs> she said, if you can't think of anything to write in your chosen genre, keep a journal. You should be keeping one anyway. Like Jennifer does, sort of. She <laughs> wow, didn't. that's in there. That's she didn't so write bad. that, no, but uh, really? yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. Journal writing helps you to be more observant of your world, and a journal is a good place to store story ideas for later projects. Wow. See, me, I just can't write when I feel like feel that great urge to write, because that's the time for what me to be glorious. What if you never feel it, David? <laughs> Only when the muse grabs your hand and writes it ah. for you can you write. No, no. No, no, that, that's not writing. Writing no. is a job. It's a it's a slog fest. You no, get up. It's a love. It's a love, but it's, it's still. Passion. I sit there every day, and my fingers go like this, and they don't stop for a couple of hours. Several hundred or thousand words. Brad is pantomiming. Yes, yes. <laughs> and you know that I do that every single day, with the exception of Sundays. Um, you know, so well, I guess maybe late, late Sunday night, but. <laughs> Uh, the reality is, is that you know, for for anyone who's going to write seriously, you got to take it like a job. Yeah. You got to think of it as a job. And even if you're only writing once a week, and you dedicate yourself to writing that every single day that week. Well, I think I think you hit on it there. That it has to be a a habit, a yes. real habit that a you actually habit. do, whether it's once a week or once a day. Yep. That you set aside time to do it and mm-hmm. put it in your schedule and yep. make it as important as it ought to be. And you've got to protect that time as if. It is more precious than gold because it is more precious than gold. How do you protect that time? 
I wish I had an answer to that completely yeah. because really, and I, that's funny. I just got, it I just finished the murder. first draft. <laughs> yeah, I just finished the first draft of an article about time being the most precious commodity we've got. Yay. And do I have an answer? No. I will tell you that as modern authors, we've spent a lot more time now doing our own social media, promoting our books. I don't care if you've got an agent or not. You're you're now out there doing it unless. You're really high up there, and you don't have to worry too much. Oh, you're Stephen King. You can publish your own grocery list. Oh, you're James. <laughs> he still has to tweet, though. He still has to tweet. He has got to get the tweets out. Technically, there. he can have someone tweeting he can. for him. Maybe yeah. under his People. name. But I, I still, you know, Neil Gaiman still has to come up with really cool stuff to put on Tumblr exactly. every day, and you know, I soak it up like crazy. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. And then we've got the biggest time suck ever out there. And this is where each of us have got to figure out our own way around that time suck. And that is the proverbial demon that sits on our shoulder saying, you suck. Don't even bother starting. Why are you writing? This th- This is not real. This is not good. Let me continue feeding this negative Twinkie to you constantly. So that's an internal, internal editor. Inter- not editor. Internal big critic. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a big Twinkie. Critic who's not actually being helpful with critiquing. Exactly. How do you get around that? That guy's a jerk. Well, <laughs> slay it, him. Yes, or as Bob uh, Baker liked to say, give your inner critic a funny voice and a funny name. And any time you hear that, then you give him like, "Oh, really? My gosh, you're horrible at it," and it'll make you laugh. <laughs> and I was gonna say, as I've written in that article, and I'm thank you. I just, I'm gonna go back and add that in. Thank, I completely <laughs> forgot that rule. But I was gonna say, just borrow from the Nike commercial. Just do it. <laughs> something something Julia Cameron, who's another writer that I absolutely adore, suggests doing, which is effective, is writing from the critic's perspective. Just if it won't shut up and you can't get any other writing done, just write down what it's saying. It'll start shutting up. <laughs> It'll start <laughs> shutting up. Because you're still writing anyway. So it's <laughs> it's the points it's making are moot. You're still doing what you were gonna do in the first place. Mm-hmm. We've all got I don't care. If how talented you are, all of us writers have got a talent, and that's a gift. And if we waste it, well, we've wasted a hell of something precious. And with that note, what's the next rule? And on that downer, we're going to go to <laughs> <laughs> I'm something, good at those. Okay. something a little related to what we were just talking about. Not the internal critic, but the internal editor. Revise your writing until it's as good as you can make it. All the reading, writing, and classes should help you do this. Check your writing, your research, she says, never neglect your research, and the physical appearance of your manuscript. Let nothing substandard slip through. If you notice something needs fixing, fix it. No excuses. There will be plenty that's wrong that you won't catch. (laughs) Ain't that the She says, make a habit of doing your best. So, uh, why... No better editor than when you hit send. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Ain't that the truth, too. Oh, so true. Once it goes published... When you're doing yeah. the Kindle, uh-huh. like, then all of a sudden it's oh, like... there's nothing oh, worse than looking through that published, printed book and finding every little error that's mm-hmm. in there. Because the beautiful stuff, that will never pop off the page to you. <laughs> no, it's going to be better. That so. double period or, you know, that, like, word that's misspelled or that, you know, missing quotation mark, just bang! Uh-huh. That's a glaring error right there. Yes. That there- you swear everyone who's going to look at that page is going to find. Because uh-huh. <laughs> they will. And they'll be like, who edited this? In fact, that's something I'm going through. I'm having someone re-edit my first book because there was so much that got missed with the editor who did that. And now I learned. At first, I didn't know. I just thought the editor did it. It was ready to go. So now I learned, and so it's going back to re-edit. But there are some authors that say never go back to your old stuff and look at it again because you always should just progress further along. And if you go back, then you're spending time that needs to be on new stuff. However, since I'm just putting it with the editor, I'm not really rewriting it myself. I'm just having some of the errors fixed. So you have to balance that. Yeah. Yeah. I just talked to Karen Whitmer Gal, who's having that very problem with her old stuff. And her old stuff was pretty <laughs> darn good, you yeah. know. But she looks at it now and says, oh, that could be so much better. So she doesn't know whether she wants to bring it out again yeah, or exactly. not. Mm-hmm. Next rule. Next rule is submit your work for publication. Who knew that would come right after (laughs) revising your writing? (laughs) Submit your work for publication. First, research the markets that interest you. Seek out and study the books or magazines of publishers to whom you want to sell. Then submit your work. If the idea of doing this scares you, 
fine. Go ahead and be afraid, but send your work out <laughs> anyway. Exactly. And even if you are self-publishing, get your work out there. She also says, if it's rejected, sit it out again and again. Rejections are painful, but inevitable. They are every writer's rite of passage. And on that note, another toast, because Octavia Butler received her first uh, rejection letter when she was 13 years old. <laughs> nice. 13. That's good to get yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. nice. She it. was going to be a writer come hell or high water. She, uh, publishers also repeatedly rejected her first book, Kindred, which is amazing, until Doubleday paid her a $5,000 advance not today's $5,000, but like 20, 30 years ago, $5,000, <laughs> the book became a bestseller. So, and continues, if I remember reading correctly, continues to be on the bestseller list. It's a lot. really good. Really good. So, yes, rejections, everyone's going to get them. Octavia Butler got them. How many awards has she gotten? Exactly. Starting at 13 years old, it's, it's necessary. It's a necessary thing. But keep submitting your work for publication. Because who knows what's going to happen to it when it's out there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Does anyone else want to say anything about submissions? Well, you'll never get published if you don't submit. Or at least try to... If you're going to do self-publishing, then you got to put it out there. Yeah. If it's uh, sitting on your computer just for you, then it's never going to get read by anyone else. So you won't you have, have to an do audience. It. Like the gamblers say, you can't win if you're not in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, speaking of not winning, if you're not in, and things about that, no, had nothing to do with that. Um, rule number six, she says, here are some potential impediments for you, to, for you to forget about. First, forget inspiration. Habit is more dependable. Habit yep. will sustain you whether you're inspired or not. Habit is persistence in practice. I'm going to add to that. Um, as I might, I'm going to call it paraphrase, but I'm probably not going to quote him 100% correct. Earl Stanley Gardner always compared his mind, if you will, to a horse. If you don't tie the horse up to the hitching post, it's going to wander away. So you got to keep your mind tied up and right and right and right. And Earl Stanley Gardner's the guy who wrote Perry Mason and had the Guinness Book of World Records for most books published at one certain time. I substituted the word muse for horse. That's I was fine. like, okay, it just needs to stay here. And the more you come back to write, the more it's likely to stay where you put it. Yeah, and this is also the habit thing about, you know, you have inspiration, and inspiration's a wonderful thing. I just posted a meme oh. on my Facebook page today about how we walk past a thousand stories every day, and good writers are the mm -hmm. ones who see five or six of them. Um, you know, so if you wait for inspiration, it will eventually come. But the point is, is that, as we were talking about writing, actually sitting mm -hmm. down and writing, forming that habit is what's going to keep that river flowing. And this is why I like multiple projects. I don't believe in writing multiple books at the same time because I, I personally can't do that. I have problems doing it. However, I will be working and planning and researching the next book that I'm going to write while I'm finishing up writing the one book so that if that one day I don't feel it, I'm sitting there at you know midnight and I'm trying to write and I just don't feel it, uh, then I'll go and do research on my next book, the one that I want to write next. And, you know, because it takes, uh, for me, about a month to get ready to write a book. So rather than wait and end and have nothing to write for that month, uh, while I just have that lag time, I'll, you know, do my research, do something else, write a something else, write a short story. I had a dream the other night that turned into a huge, mega short story that's probably going to be a novel, or a novelette. Nice. Cool. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you never know when it's going to come. She also says, forget talent. If you have it, fine. Use it. If you don't have it, it doesn't matter. As habit is more dependable than inspiration, continued learning is more dependable than talent. Oh, was Neil Gaiman? Thank God. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember Neil Neil Gaiman's um, commencement speech where he said you need three things, and really you only need two out of three. One is if people like talking to you or like you coming around, that helps if it, if you're on time. That helps, and I think the other one was if you've got talent. But I don't remember that. But no, it was the, it was those three, yeah, and you only have I to have remember. two out of three. Right, you only have to have two out of three. You can be a sorry, I'm not using his words. I'm using mine. You can be a bastard, but as long as you've got talent and you're on time, your editors will love you. <laughs> <laughs> and you can write terribly, but if you're always on time and it's always a pleasure to hear from you, they'll want more. Yes. <laughs> All right. Finally, she says, "Don't worry about imagination." 
You have all the imagination you need and all the reading, journal writing, and learning you will be doing will stimulate it. Play with your ideas, have fun with them. Don't worry about being silly, outrageous, or wrong. So much of writing is fun. Enjoy the fun, enjoy the fun while you can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't miss it, Brad. You were going to say something. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was. Uh, for me, like, I don't know. Imagination is the fun part. Uh, getting to play around, getting to think about stuff, going crazy. I mean, this is one of the reasons I read I write <coughs> steampunk, is because any time I write a scene, uh, the best part of being a steampunk author is then I get to sit there and go, "That was good." But how can I steampunk this? <laughs> what crazy invention can I stick in here? You know, the guy's opening a door. Well, that's that's one way of doing it. But uh, there's probably a device that I can create in my head that's going to open that door for him. Or, you know, something along those lines. And, and that's the fun part. You know, that's where the fun comes in. And to me, it's all going back and it's just like sitting around playing with Star Wars characters, you know, the little figurines. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's when I was a kid, and I'm doing the same thing now, I just don't actually have figurines most of the time. I have kind of the same experience with, with mysteries, as I will find my character doing something, like hiding something, and I have no idea why, but isn't it fun for me to try to figure out why <laughs> so that it works into the plot of the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, subplots are great for that. I was going to say, inspiration, talent, imagination, um... It's kind of terrible and also kind of a relief to hear that those don't really matter in the long run. In the long run, if you form a good habit for writing, those will come. It's perspiration, not inspiration. If yes. you build it, they will come. If you sit your butt <laughs> If in you chair, write it, they, they will, will read it. Mm -hmm. yeah. As long it, as you will... publish it. Yes. If yes. it's sitting it, on your come. computer or in the drawer, it's not going to get read. After your death, maybe. That's think, happened to too many people. I think not realizing that it's more um, a hard habit of writing over and having inspiration, I think, sometimes leads some people to become either hacks, if you will, writing books that they should not have written, or stealing ideas. Or plagiarizing, in fact, just stealing, Pure, stealing. Yes. <laughs> Plagiarism is awful. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the last one that I'm going to read. It's the last one. Are you holding a couple hostage? No. A toast to the a last toast. roll. A toast, a toast to her last, last roll. My drink just got stolen. I mean, plagiarized. I mean, stolen. Stolen. It is mine now. Oh, my Go gosh. Ahead. All right. Um, this is the last one, period. Not just, you know, I'm not holding any back. She says, <laughs> At last I begin to say, when people were talking about her talents, that my most important talent or habit was persistence. Without it, I would have given up writing long before I finished my first novel. It's amazing what we can do if we simply refuse to give up. I suspect that this is the most important thing I've said in all my interviews and talks, as well as in this book, which is Bloodchild. It's a truth that applies to more than writing. It applies to anything that is important but difficult, important but frightening. We're all capable of climbing so much higher than we usually permit ourselves to suppose. The word, again, is persist. I hope that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, it served her pretty well. Exactly. And I'll say this, I mean, it's completely non-writer comment here. This is the black belt in me from martial arts. Well, how do you become a black belt? You don't become invincible. You don't become um, this thing that can t take bullets in a single bound or whatever. It's your persistence. Persistence past your pains, past your failures, past your injuries to reach that level. Well, I would say as writers, we're always going to go to that dark place where we think we should quit, we think we should stop, we don't know if we should continue writing, if we should go get, like, a real job and, you know, actually quit doing what we do every day. You know, maybe go to the gym or something instead of spending those hours writing. <laughs> but, you know, the reality is is that persistence, writing every day, continuing on that path, no matter what, uh, is what's going to get you through it all and through those dark periods. And it, it gets easier. I mean, I know that people who are just starting out writing anything find it very difficult in, in any number of mm -hmm. ways. But it, the more you do it, the easier it gets. You develop your writing muscles, your writing yep. brain, and then that grows to the outside so that you develop further your observation powers, which are the details that make your writing readable, entertaining that bring pop culture or whatever it is you're trying to bring to the table mm -hmm. or to your writing at least. So mm -hmm. 
make sure that uh, you keep it up. And if you keep it up consistently, you will absolutely have to get better at it. <laughs> That's something that I've noticed about writing uh, novels for me when I'm completely immersed in a novel. I can tell because I'm writing it all the time, and when I'm not writing it, I'm looking at the world and seeing it through the character's eyes. So I'm like, oh, this song fits this character very much, or... I'm looking out because I'm taking a walk and I see the trees and I describe it in my head as the character would see it, not as I see it, because I see it differently. And I'm like, oh, I'm in it now. In the zone! Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm right now, actually, when you were just saying that, I was actually thinking about the Himalayas and the ending of my book. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Even when I should be talking on the radio, I'm thinking <laughs> about my book. But that <laughs> comes from habit, it comes from a writing habit, or obsession. Either Positive one obsession, works. the name of the other essay in her book. Anytime that you're not thinking about something else, I'd be willing to say you're probably thinking about probably. your mm -hmm. book. I mean, you might be thinking about how to cook dinner or what to have for dinner, but there is a part of your brain which is still, and for me, in 1899 New York. <laughs> Doing the dishes is an amazing time for me to think kind about story. Yeah. yeah. Repetitive tasks, repetitive uh so the shower. Vacuuming is yes. good? Yes. I wish it would not be in the shower because I have no way to get paper or anything to write on. Driving. There are ways around that. There are chalkboards and, <laughs> you know, like uh, whiteboards and stuff like that you can put in the shower. Not that I not do that. Not in my shower. <laughs> not that I do that. I oh, just think just about it. Oh, just get a waterproof <laughs> pen and, and one of those... What about like things? a yeah. like voice record? Yeah. Grease pencils. I use, Grease pencil, yeah. <laughs> I use a voice memo app on my phone to record when I'm driving because I get plenty of ideas when I'm driving and I'll just... Driving is another good one. ...record yeah. it and send it to myself or put it on uh, Evernote. This is why I want self-driving cars because on like a 13-hour <laughs> road trip, I think way too much and I have no way of recording it really. That's like 13 hours of pure work time I could be doing. Wow. Yeah. This is why I want self-driving cars. Google, get on that. <laughs> All right, well, we've definitely had some Octavia E. Butler-type fun. Is there anything else you guys want to say before the episode wraps up? Because it seems like we're almost out of time. We are almost out of time. This has been a great conversation. Any last thoughts? Well, how about we like to hear from you? Do you have any stories or tips that you'd like to share with us? Or some maybe an author that you would like us to look into? And she doesn't mean me, guys. <laughs> She's talking about you, the audience. We would love to hear from you on the on any of the authors you'd like for us to talk about, look into. Do you have a favorite? Do you have an Octavia E. Butler has affected you like she did to Kathleen? And finally, because you are our audience and we want to make sure that your listening experience feels worthwhile to you, let us know if there's anything you want us to address in the episodes. Let us know how we can make your listening experience better. Because we are, we are you know, recording for you guys. And we want to make sure you guys enjoy yourselves learn a lot and feel like we are not wasting your time and on that note have a great have, have a great week writing and tune in next week for another interesting topic in the writing industry the new theme songs for right pack radio were written and performed by meredith tate all copyrights remain with her right pack radio would like to thank stl books for allowing us to record in their office stl books is a online bookstore specializing in new and used high quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.